Welcome. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook Live. Uh, again, we're, we're talking today about uh, the criminal justice system and actually particularly how to expand alternatives to incarceration. We appreciate you being here and I'm going to introduce our wonderful guests and then we'll get a conversation going. I'm John Hamilton, the Mayor of Bloomington. You're welcome to send in questions if you like uh, via the Facebook uh, Live connection or the website and please feel free to do that. Uh, we're going to be talking about alternatives to incarceration and uh, I'm going to go around the table uh, from, from my left to right with Dr. Greg May first who is the Administrative Director of Adult and Family Services at Center Stone. Uh, next to him is Tammy Giles. Giles, I love yes. Tammy Giles. Thank you, Tammy, for being here. Who's a street out outreach worker with Center Stone? Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Police Bloomington Police Chief Mike Dekoff. Thanks, Mike, for being here. To my immediate right is the Marion County Monroe, Monroe County <laughs> Prosecutor. Monroe County Prosecutor. That's where you are. Uh, Erica Oliphant. Thank you, Erica, for being uh, part of this. And then around the table we have Melissa Stone, who is a brand new employee of the Bloomington Police Department with a new position there, the Bloomington Police Social Worker. Thank you, Melissa. And, uh, and then last around the table, Brett Rora, uh, with the Police Department, who is one of the downtown resource officers. So we'll hear from all of, uh, all of us uh, shortly and get the conversation going. Let me, let me just try to frame it a little bit um, in terms of talking about alternatives to incarceration, why, why we are doing that, um, what we hope to talk about today. So um, there is a lot of reform going on, there has been, and there's a lot still going on in terms of criminal justice system, uh, incarceration, and, uh, and approaches to criminal justice at the national level, at the state level, and at the local level. Um, why? Uh, many reasons. One of them is because we know there are much better outcomes for people that can be done rather than incarceration. Um, incarceration, uh, being in a jail or uh, in, a, in a prison, uh, can cause a lot of difficulty, of course. There are reasons for it, but there are many alternatives that have been developed and found to, to give much better outcomes for the people uh, involved in the criminal justice system. So better outcomes is one. Another, we know uh, many things that cause us our friends, our neighbors, our family members to get into the criminal justice system are not really criminal justice problems. They are health problems. Huge issue with substance use disorder or mental health issues that can cause people to get into the criminal justice system, but arresting and incarcerating are not really ways that effectively respond to that. So, so uh, we can't arrest our way out of many of these problems. Also, uh, another reason to think about alternatives, we know our, our criminal justice system has baked into it over long periods of time, and we still see today disparities. Uh, it affects communities of color differently. It affects communities uh, of economic uh, lack uh, differently. Uh, so, our, so our criminal justice system has um, disparities that we see in it, and looking at alternatives to how to respond better to those is another reason to do it. And finally, Sometimes alternatives are, are cheaper, they cost less, uh, they're more effective for the people, they're, they, they deal with things better, but they're also less expensive uh, to the public uh, that pays for those. So um, we have a long history of, of uh, diversion and alternatives to incarceration, and we'll talk about that uh, momentarily. The, the last thing I want to say just to start is um, some of us are in government, some of us work with government just getting a general frame of which parts of government are doing what, and, and, and I'll let you guys expand on that. But for example, uh, Erica, as a county prosecutor from the county side, it's really under state law the county runs most of the criminal justice system. They run the, you're the, the lead prosecutor for the county. Uh, the county also runs the court system that, that respond uh, and run the courts. The county runs the incarceration local system, the jail. Um, you're, you're partnering with uh, your sheriff, which is the law enforcement side at the county level, and the Bloomington Police Department from the city side is the law enforcement side, which obviously feeds into, intersects with the, uh, the law enforcement, the, the civil uh, criminal justice system. So city does some, county does a lot, um, 
And then we have uh, partners like the Centerstone Mental Health Services that also intersects a lot with these systems. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of players. So what, what I thought we might start with, and I might start with, with Erica, uh, maybe you first, and then Mike, uh, and then Greg, maybe you can jump in, is just kind of give a little history of, oh, I don't know, the last 10, 20 years, kind of what, what are some of the diversion things that are already going on, and where, where did they come from, and how have they been working, and, and we can jump in with questions if we're, if I'm confused or if others are confused by it, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. So, uh, some of the alternatives that we have here in Monroe County and that we've had for a little while, um, during the Salzman administration, approximately, I would guess, 15 years ago, although my history <laughs> might be off a little bit in terms of timing, um, he used a statutory mechanism to create a prosecutor's office diversion program, and we kept that going through the Gall administration, and in fact, I, I'm administering that diversion program. And how that works is once someone is charged with criminal offense, it's traditionally been misdemeanors, and there are some things that are statutorily excluded. For example, operating while intoxicated is not allowed to be a part of the diversion. Under state law. Under the state, state statute. Yeah. Um, Post-charge cases, we enter into an agreement um, where if they comply with conditions of the agreement, we dismiss the charge. Um, so it keeps that off their record, keeps them from experiencing some of the collateral um, consequences of having a conviction on their record. Um, so that comes after an arrest. Or a or, citation. Or, or a citation mm -hmm. comes to your office and you guys have a path that you send people, and been doing it for a number of years, send people into that diverts them from kind of the formal charge and sure. conviction. And they're usually identified as being eligible at the stage of making a charging decision. Uh, so typically uh, at the moment of their initial hearing, which in other, other jurisdictions we call that arraignment, but in Indiana we call it an initial hearing. At that stage, they're got, they okay. go ahead and get presented with the pretrial diversion option if and, okay. and given an option to accept that. Um, I, I would guess, again, it was probably 15 years ago um, when Carl Salzman was the elected prosecutor and when Judge Todd was on the bench, um, Monroe County started its first drug treatment court, uh, which is still going strong. And I served on the drug treatment court for about five years as the prosecutor representative. It's something that I feel really strongly about. But so what did that do? What was it? Uh, well, I've probably heard of that, but how does it sure. work? So it's designed for people who are usually facing, while well, they're facing felony offenses, um, usually uh, not violent offenses, um, that, and they've usually been in the system. It's, it's designed for high risk, high need, which is sort of a way of saying these are people that continue to have problems with substance use that brings them back to the criminal justice system repeatedly. And so what happens there is they are charged with their offense, they're usually made eligible pretty early. In fact, evidence-based practices, it's, it's, you get better outcomes if you can get people involved in the court earlier, ideally within the first 30 days of, of having charges filed. Um, but basically, they plead guilty to an offense and then sentencing is deferred. And what that means is you just put off sentencing for a couple of years to allow people to comply with the conditions of the tr drug treatment court. And those conditions include staying out of trouble, engaging in intensive services. There's a multidisciplinary team um, that sort of keeps them on track. It, there's a schedule of incentives and sanctions. You know, of course, behavioral science is showing that positive reinforcement is more effective than negative reinforcement, although we do have some negative consequences. We try to focus on positive rewards as well to get people moving through the system, try to help them get employed, um, stay, you know, stay clean and sober. I, I shouldn't use the word clean. I know that has a little bit of stigma attached to it, but it's a long time having dealt with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, but basically try to keep people um, free from drugs and alcohol outside of, as long as they're participating in an approved, like, medication assisted treatment program, uh -huh. that's fine, but try to keep them otherwise on track. And so that's been operating, that drug court, numbers of people go through it, I assume, every year, yeah. every week, every day, I don't know how. So there's, I don't know exactly how many people are in there now, I didn't check our current stats, but I would say on average it's usually around 100 people. 121. Yeah. 
Sorry Thanks, Greg. <laughs> I knew um, I knew it would try to stay around yeah. 100, 125. Right. Um, we also, in the last couple of years, have developed a veterans treatment court um, to deal with the specific issues that military service members uh -huh. deal with. Um, we also have a mental health court that's relatively recent vintage that deals with mental health that's not substance use disorder. Uh, and then we also have a reentry court that's designed for nonviolent offenders coming out of the Department of Corrections to transition them into this, into living in. And, and all of those are meant to really create alternatives to incarceration. I think Does that, mean, is that yes. fair to say? It, we're trying to minimize the use of incarceration outside of violent offenses. But I think another important key is if you're reducing recidivism, which recidivism is a tendency for someone to reoffend once they've been convicted of an offense. Um, if you can reduce recidivism, you're going to reduce the strain that the courts are seeing with um, repeated criminal justice right. contacts. That's very helpful. Thank you. I'm sure there's more you can share and will. Um, Mike, maybe you can talk from the police perspective, sure. of your sense of the history of this and what we've been doing. So we have um, operated diversion programs for many years. We started probably 20 plus years ago and created uh, uh, our community's first CIT program, which CIT stands for Critical Incident Training. Um, and it's, it's a, a program that was developed out of uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And a lot of people refer to it as a Memphis model, but it's a program that law enforcement agencies use to um, divert people who are in a mental crisis that the police have been called for um, away from incarceration. <clears throat> and um, when we started it, uh, it, it, it got going because there was an incident that had happened in the community and um, we, we just didn't have the, the training that um, we thought we should have. So, so, um, let, me, so let me just understand, so this is, kind of training police officers with skills to respond to a situation that one response would be, I'm gonna arrest you because you're exactly. not acting, you're not following instructions, et cetera, whatever. Exactly. But training the police to recognize arrest may not be the best resolution. There may be alternatives to right. the arrest. And so uh, the, the Memphis model operates on a, kind of on a small team concept, but uh, the, when we looked at it, it was, that wasn't going to serve us very well because we operate 24 hours a day. We may not have those teams on duty. So we ended up training um, all of our people. Uh, we also trained dispatchers because they take those phone calls. We trained our front office people because people come in off of the street to talk to our records division. Um, we train EMTs. We train firefighters because they're all first responders and they all, they all um, interact with people that could be experiencing some kind of mental health issue. And is so it kind of a de-escalation? It is. Also there's a, where there's you're a lot to... of de-escalation yeah. training. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, awareness training on, on, on different things to pick up on if, you, if you're talking to someone who might have some kind of mental health issue. Um, so that, is, that has been going on for many, many years. Um, we also have our downtown resource officer program that uh, we're, we're starting our sixth year of uh -huh. that program. Uh -huh. and. We created that program because we were seeing a, a big increase in the number of calls we were getting, dealing with people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who experience homelessness either have a mental health issue, some kind of addiction issue. Um, and so, again, we saw it as we were getting a lot of minor nuisance calls on, on people. Um, and and you, said, you said this earlier, arresting our way out of this isn't, isn't the answer. So, we started this program, we looked at a variety of different programs around the country and, and, and took bits and pieces and put together our program. Um, and we started with six officers and they work basically from around eight in the morning to eight at night. And they go out and they respond to um, calls that, some, that might have something to do with a homelessness issue, a mental health issue, an addictions issue. But they also go out and they, they know where homeless camps are. And so we partner with a lot of social service agencies in the community. Uh, Centerstone is one of them, and I'll let I'll let them kind of talk about how their their interaction with us. But we will actually go out and look for people to try to, to get them into services. Right. And so that's been very successful. This year we added a seventh officer. We we put a supervisor in charge of the program. Um, 
we also hired our first police social worker, Melissa Stone, and um, she's part of that team. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have uh, some neighborhood resource specialists that will probably also work with the DROs and other, other officers in the department to help with those minor nuisance things that could lead to an arrest um, and try not, not to make that arrest. Great, great. Let, let's, um, so I, I'm, I'm a non-expert at this table uh, and I, I appreciate just trying to, trying to understand this kind of history of reducing the use of kind of the bluntest tool of arrest, incarceration, in terms of dealing with behaviors that are causing difficulty in the community. That, maybe that's one way to, to think about it. And, and Greg, I may go to you next. Um, and we'll, we'll again, I'll remind you, if you want to uh, send in a question, please feel free to do so. Uh, and, and Greg, maybe you can help us transition, if you will, from this government speak sure. uh, uh, about the role of Centerstone and let people know what Centerstone does yeah. in general, and then your interaction with the criminal justice system. And then I want to open it up to some people who are kind of working on the streets, if you will, every day, and kind of your, some, of, some of the experiences of how diversion actually happens or not. Great, thanks. So, um, Centerstone is the community mental health center in Bloomington and Monroe County, and we work primarily with people with mental health and substance use uh, disorders and substance misuse issues, um, and we offer the full continuum of care. So, any type of service that someone might need from the initial intake and about um, uh, initial intake and evaluation, all the way through continuing services, um, inpatient uh, residential treatment programs, group homes, scattered site apartments, and everything in between, as well as psychiatry and nursing services, mm -hmm. is uh, something that is available at Centerstone. Um, the, the role of government is important because whether it be city government or county government, those are the agencies that are respond, uh, responsible for identifying the people that have a treatment need and then they get them to Centerstone or another treatment provider in the community. And the reason that treatment is important as well as helping people get resources is that we know that arresting our way out of a situation is not an option and sending people to the Department of Correction and throwing away the key doesn't help um, because 98% of people come out of incarceration or they come out of prison. So if we've not identified what the treatment issue is or resource issues like, you know, were they stealing because they can't get a job because of a criminal uh, history right. issue, or, um, you know, do they have a reputation in the community so they just don't get a second look when it comes to, you know, job search or other type programs, the situation's never gonna get better. So identifying, you know, treatment needs and um, housing issues and helping with job issues, that's what helps people recover and it begins to build recovery capital. And recovery capital is something that is important because it's the things that people have access to that help them recover and be able to, um, you know, have their needs met in a way where they're not interacting with county government, whether you know be the sheriff or the jail or the prosecutor, public defenders or you know city folks like um, uh, DROs or the uh, Blue Shirt PD officers. So it really is about finding what is the need that the person has. So do you, for example, uh, Erica was talking about the drug court. Do, does Centerstone participate in that? I mean, you get yeah, pulled so, into that. Yep, so um, I sit on all four of the problem solving courts. So drug court, reentry court, mental health court, and um, veterans treatment court. And I'm the person at the table that you know helps with decision making processes to determine what kind of treatment may be appropriate for someone, where they need to go, if we're doing something and we're not seeing the, you know, the behavior change or if there's still an issue with um, substance use at that point, then maybe we need a higher level of care. Mm -hmm. uh, I then also act as the liaison back to the Centerstone side to make sure that the providers that are not in court know what's going on with each of the participants mm -hmm. so that we can adjust the plans appropriately. All right. and, and that's something else that um, EPD also has been team since its inception and we uh, uh, within the last year also um, the DROs have started to participate in the mental health court mm -hmm. so set they're familiar with with people that are in there and so the, the communication is really important um, does that mean literally and I know you worked at the drug court as a prosecutor too is, does that mean literally you're all at a table talking about one person yes with a judge or, or yes, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, we have staffing meetings once a week um, where we staff each case 
And so present is Judge Mary, Judge Mary Ellen Decoff is the uh, presiding judge for all of the problem solving courts currently. Um, we have a Bloomington Police Department representative, we have a public defender representative, a prosecutor representative, several um, treatment representatives. There's also a couple of retired community members that are involved. Um, and, then and then you go through case file by case. file, kind of case by case. Mm -hmm. Checking. Individual by individual, the case wow. managers let us know um, sort of what's going on with the person, if they have any issues, if they are doing well and need to be rewarded for that, that, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Centerstone gives the same report from the treatment side. If it's somebody that's in treatment with Centerstone, if there's a particular struggle that the person has, um, you know, we can talk about that. If they're doing really well, um, you know, we talk about what, what incentive that, that we may give so that we see more of that. that's not the right word, but the sort of replacement behavior that's replacing whatever the problematic uh -huh. behavior was that led them to uh, encounter the criminal justice system. So you, you did, you were a number guy, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know, you said 121, I think, in the drug court. Do you know how many in the other so specialties? It's, it's 121 total. There are 74 in the drug court, 27 in reentry court, 10 in veterans treatment court, and 10 in mental health court. I see. So that's how many people are being have been diverted, if you will, or yep. they're, they're in these programs uh, in our in our county. Yeah, and the composition of the teams uh, that, that Erica was talking about, I, I think it's really important because total there's 121 people that participate in the courts and there's probably 25 members of treatment teams that participate that involve treatment members, county people, city people, mm -hmm. um, retired community members, the judge. So it, it, it really is a wraparound approach wow. that we can get the best idea of what's going on with the person and how we can help best. Great. Uh, again, thanks if you're, if you're following and want to throw questions our way, we welcome those. But let's, let's turn, um, if we can, to talk. Um, uh, we've, we've talked with Erica Oliphant, <coughs> the Monroe County Prosecutor, and Mike Decoff, the Police Chief, and Dr. Greg May uh, from Centerstone, but let's turn to some of our folks who are working more directly, perhaps, uh, uh, with this. And, and Tammy Giles, who's with Centerstone, uh, Brett Roram, Police Department, uh, Downtown Resource Officer, and, and Melissa Stone, uh, new new uh, uh, social worker. We'll start with you last, because you, you're, you're on the job like a week and a half. Yes. Like so you get a break for that. But, but um, uh, Brett or Tammy, whoever, feels um, maybe kind of talk to us about from your seat, your role, what does diversion mean? How does it play out? How does it happen? You know? Well, just kind of what you are saying earlier, arresting people, that's not uh, curing the issue. This diversion is helping so much, like we're working with Centerstone Mental Health Court, for example, there's an individual that if they have been barred from someplace, we're trying to lift that barrier for them so they can go back and get services there, or they can go back to that place. Why don't you back up a minute? Just tell us what what a day is like in in, in your day. What, what what do you what do you do in a jury? I mean, speak up so everybody yeah. can hear you. Yeah, so. and, and daily for us is we start at uh, seven in the morning or at twelve thirty in the afternoon. Uh, uh, we come in, we wear a white shirt, which is different from the normal police officer, right. a blue shirt. Right. This kind of breaks down a lot of barriers. We have weekly meetings with Centerstone staff, mental health court team. Um, we also spend a lot of time with Wheeler, outreaching with them. Wheeler Mission, yes. uh, shelter mm -hmm. services. Uh -huh. And in that shalom too. Uh -huh. Our day will usually start when we will go and we'll check with Tammy, Centerstone folks, and now since we have Melissa, she'll write with us too. And we'll go in or out, interact and outreach with these local organizations, seeing how we can help them. Mm -hmm. And then we will get calls. So they may tell you we had this happen last night or I've got this issue with this person or yeah. can you And vice versa, we'll tell them, hey, we've interacted with subject A. And they say, oh great, this is what we need to do for him or her. Uh -huh. we'll start trying to build a bridge for them. And how different was that from the kind of traditional police officer role, I guess? The traditional right. police officer role, we were going Which you there. were also. Right, yes, did that first. I started in the program when it first started, but I was a normal blue shirt police officer for several years. That role was we'd go there, we'd investigate, we'd take, take the report, make an arrest if that was deemed. Mm -hmm. so, that was it? Right, correct. Yeah. Okay. In this role, we are actually really working with the individual, seeing what options we working with the courts, working with Centerstone, trying to develop a better program in a way to help them stay out. Uh-huh, okay. 
Tammy, uh, how, how, what, tell us what your day is like, maybe, uh, if you have a... a I, well, I was just thinking more along examples of how yeah. we divert people. Yeah. We were in actually in the DRO meeting at the police station, and a gentleman who has a severe mental illness was downtown causing a scene. They got the call, and I was able to go downtown with them, and we got the gentleman to calm down. The blue shirts were ready to take him to jail because he was being very disruptive, and I was able to go with them downtown, right. Talk to the gentleman, get him to calm down, and said, you're gonna to go to jail if you don't leave the area. We really need you to move along. And he did, he responded really well, and he moved along and didn't end up in jail that day for being disruptive. So that, that's interesting. So just again, as kind of a lay person here, so somebody is acting out, somebody, somebody uh, for, for reasons as you can describe, and the public calls the police to say this, this is going on, I can't deal with it, you know, get the police down here. You get the call, goes to dispatch, they send police officers. And the traditional thing would be, we, we can't get this person to settle down. You, you have CIT tra the training, but you know, even that may not work right. enough, but there's more resources. So right. how do you get called in that? What, what, how does we, that we, we, we get the call, okay. and a lot of the times what happens is we'll get the call, and if it's an individual we know and we know we work with them, or we haven't, we'll still outreach with them. A lot of times we say, hey, we are going to this call. Are you available? Uh -huh. A lot of times Tammy's available. Center Just cell, cell phone call? Yeah, or yes. Cell phone call. Yes. Yeah, okay. Or they'll text me. Right. Hey, are That's you really free good. right now? Okay. And right. we've actually just come by and picked Tammy up before <laughs> and go with us on the call. Uh -huh. And now having Melissa, we'll be able to bring her with us because she's employed with us now too and just go straight to the problem. And, you, the social and you know the person better, if you will, or you know more about them than the blue shirt, if we say. Correct. Yeah. And I think one of the benefits of going to the meetings we make twice a week is that if there is someone that's gotten a lot of calls for being disruptive or trespassing in Kroger where they shouldn't be, you know, because they've shoplifted or something, Yeah. we can discuss that person and he'll say, this one's on our radar, and then I can go out without the police officers and try to talk to the person. Uh -huh. um, we actually had a gentleman who was homeless and I was able to help him do an assessment, get housed, he is now medicated and I work with him probably two to three hours a week doing life skills and other stuff and his arrest has went down tremendously. The, the nice thing about this program, when we first started it, we, um, we, we tried to identify um, like the top 50 people that we had the most calls on mm -hmm. and so we kept stacks on that for a year, and at the end of that first year, we had a 50% reduction in arrest with that with that target group of people. After the year, after first year, the year, the downtown and, resource office, yes. white shirts. And then there was also a 30% decrease in the number of emergency room visits, mm -hmm. because they used the emergency room as their primary care physician. And so that was a benefit to the hospital, because they are not dealing with, with all of the, the minor issues yeah. that people have. but. Um, what, what's happened as this program con continues on is that even the blue shirt officers, the regular police officers, if they have had contact with someone that they think that, hey, the DROs could really help out in this situation, there's that communication. So they're saying, hey, are you guys familiar with this person? And if they say no, they go, well, you know, they're hanging out here, maybe you guys. And so they'll go and they'll look for people that we've had calls on. So. Communication's great, the, the networking and the partnerships that we've had in the community. We have grant money that we give out to mm -hmm. Centerstone, to Shalom Center, um, to other social service agencies that partner with us so that we can get services to, mm -hmm. to those in need. You know, I was gonna ask about money because all this takes money and I, I was thinking about Centerstone. You must have different ways you get compensated through, is it through Medicaid or other yeah. ways to pay for these services? Yeah, through Medicaid. Medicare, commercial insurance, uh -huh. uh, there are some people that pay cash for services, there's some funding through the State Department of uh, Medicaid that is available yeah. to us, and then of course money from you know the city to do things like street outreach, um, we have an employment support program that's funded through what Mike was talking about, where um, folks that are struggling with finding jobs for whatever reason, um, they can uh, come to Centerstone, we can help them with the job search process, following up uh, after they've applied, we help with resume writing, um, uh -huh. we do some soft skill work, uh, you know, how to deal with conflict that's coming up in the workplace rather than, you know, having an altercation with someone, um, you know, how to use words to resolve that issue, showing up on time, um, appearance uh -huh. issues, um, 
the thing that I want j just to talk about quickly when it comes to diversion programs that I don't know um, gets the amount of attention that it should is that if these programs are really creating a safety net for people until they're ready to participate in treatment. So, you know, my staff along with the um, downtown resource officers are not going out and arresting people for nuisance behavior. They're checking up on them and they're offering resources and they're offering food and they're offering shoes and they're offering coats. And sometimes you may have to do that 15 or 20 times before someone is willing to have an interaction with you and say, yeah, maybe I do need help. So um, I, I just want to put that out there that yes, they're great, but they don't go out one time and say, hey, we're it here takes, to help you. And the person's like, yeah, I'm ready. It's, I've been it's, waiting for yeah, you. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that may happen on occasion. I think yeah. Tammy's had one or two of those cases in a couple of years that we've been doing that. But usually, it's a number of interactions before we get to the point where someone says, I'm ready to do this. It's creating the relationship yeah. and building that. Um, I, I don't know, Eric, if you have a reaction from the prosecution and the, the kind of the criminal justice side hearing that, or if you, is it working like that, or does it, you know? Does I think it, it is. Um, you know, the, the thing about these kind of programs is if they're going well, it doesn't come to me and I don't, don't. hear about it. <laughs> because yeah. we get the people that get cited or arrested and, and kind of deal with them in, in that kind of way. But, um, you know, certainly, I encourage this kind of this kind of diversion because it does help um, reduce. We we have ever increasing caseloads in the county um, for a variety of reasons, and and a lot of it has to do with substance use disorder and mental health. And so, um, anything we can do to try to preempt that and prevent them from coming to us, I see as a positive thing. Great. I'm not going to get territory. <laughs> well, it's inter you know, it's it's one of those things where there's so many players that benefits here can you know they, they flow to different places like you mentioned the hospital or you mentioned the jail you mentioned you know our, it affects our school system it affects employers it, and all these these benefits often uh, flow when you don't even know why they flow the no news is the good news right it didn't it didn't come and and Melissa I'm gonna. I'm going to come to you in a second, then I do have a question, but Melissa, I know you're just, just starting, but just starting, maybe yeah. you can reference what you think your role can be or, or uh, you know, where you see stepping into this. Yeah, sure. So what I'm already seeing in a week and a half is a lot of really great coordination and partnerships already. So what I don't want to do is try to recreate some wheel, right? So I want to work with the partners that we have, Centerstone, um, in the prosecutor's office, whoever we need to work with, I wanna just be a key player in the coordination of that. Our officers have so much to do, and there are a lot of calls. Um, so sometimes we get some people to work with who have very long-term, things that take a lot of time to work out. So maybe I can jump in there and do some of, some of the case management aspects on the back end and assist people with that so our officers can make sure they're still doing it, go out there doing what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely see that as an option. You've been doing ride along. Yes. Right? <laughs> and I, I did I remember a ride along where it, it was it's striking how much time often an individual police call interaction is dealing with what most of us I think would call social services, you know, behavioral yeah. issues where support services are needed and and uh, so part of this is trying to strengthen strengthen that. Um, well, let me, I, I, we got a question, let me read to you uh, from Jean, thank you Jean. This question says, given that research shows 40 to 60% of people in the criminal justice system have a history of at least one brain injury compared to only 8.5% of the general population, those are statistics she's sharing, I, the, and that brain injury often makes it harder for people to participate in and benefit from treatment interventions. Are the various parties involved in the diversion programs screening people for brain injuries and making appropriate referrals? Is a brain injury an issue you think about, consider if a person is having difficulty complying with requirements? So I'll throw that out there too. Well, I know for a while, and I haven't been on the drug court team in a couple of years, I know that we actually had some grant money for um, traumatic brain injury treatment, and so we were doing screenings if people were having trouble with their traditional um, treatment modalities. I, maybe Greg can speak more to that. So um, I like this question from Jean because I was just thinking, 
yesterday, I needed the contact gene. Um, <laughs> no gene. And I do not have gene contact uh, information. I can help you. Um, because, yeah, so we do refer people out if there are issues with them uh, participating in treatment requirements. What we don't have, and my question for Gene is that, uh, is there a brief screener that can be used that says, yes, this is indicative of a larger problem and they should be referred to this place? Um, because there, there, are, um, there are a lot of people that have brain injuries and it's usually not reported because it happens as a part of the course of something else or it happens during a period of incarceration and it, it's not something that the individual thinks to report, but it does impact their ability to participate in a treatment program. I know that Jean provided me with a screen. We all I was going to say, I have one on my desk for him. I'm pretty sure she came and talked to our team. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, we have another comment, and this, this is from Tony. Thank you, Tony. Tony is is um, trying to remind us this doesn't always work. Uh, and he says, look, you're, you claim you're doing all this, yet, according to Tony, yesterday a man was stopped for a seatbelt stop and ended up getting tased. Um, you haven't mentioned that. I hate how it seems. Anyway, he, he's concerned that we're we're acting like this is a, a wonderful system. Uh, and whatever good we're able to do, I'm, I'm sure there are cases where it doesn't work and where, where things happen in those interactions. Don't go as we hope. And I don't know if any of you want to talk about that or, or I, I think that I mean that's always the possibility mm -hmm. uh, you know we're, we're trying these programs that we're doing we're trying to um, we're, we're trying our best to not arrest people um, we, we have certain populations that we uh, we get calls on that we're familiar with and these programs that we have set up are designed to interact and and lessen the chance that someone could get arrested uh, I'm not familiar with the incident that he's talking about. Uh, we don't have tasers, so it wasn't the Bloomington Police Department. Um, and so uh, it, 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 it does happen. Where it does. And, and you know, we, we can't, we, we try the best we can to, to um, make the best situation possible on these calls. And, and there's not a lot of police departments that have a dedicated unit like we do, like our downtown resource mm -hmm. officers. Um, a lot of departments do CIT training. Um, bigger departments have outreach teams, but for an agency our size to have have one that is this organized and this involved, and the partners that we have, and the money that we have available for grants, mm -hmm. um, that that is is something I think that um, speaks very highly of our community because we have a lot of partners that that help us do our job. Well, that that let's let's use that as a transition. I mean, one of the one of the things that I find helpful and I was hoping we could share was this sense of history and programs that we have uh, that are making a difference uh, every day I think and for uh, more than 100 people they're in these special courts and, and daily interactions that we've talked about but let's think about what's next um, what are what are the challenges out there I know uh, 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 Greg you're, you're in charge of or chairing a commission that, that's looking at certain things and I know several of you, uh, several of us, county, city, other partners from the health sector and services sector are trying to think about what's next. New social workers next. Um, what are other things that are on the horizon that you see here that we're thinking about or that we ought to be thinking about? And I'll kind of just throw that open. So we, there has been a group in the community that has been meeting for uh, um, that involves uh, city government, county government, private business, uh, treatment providers, medical providers, to talk about um, the opioid issue, substance um, use disorder issues, things like that. And um, there are lots of diversion programs out there, and, and that's, that's a component of this group that's been meeting, is to research what other things are out there that we might be able to do here. And, and, we have, uh, within the last few weeks, taken a team and visited uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, who has a, a diversion program. Uh, we looked at that. We're looking at a couple of other diversion programs to see how those might work and fit in our community. Um, they're all run a little different. The, 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 the theory behind them is all the same, but it's, it's to, uh, it's a pre, they're pre-arrest diversion so that we're not, we're not getting people who are committing minor offenses caught up in the criminal justice system because um, someone said earlier that arrest on your record 
has yeah. lots of collateral impact. Um, it affects future employment, future housing. And so um, if, we can, if we can divert people who have, have these, these issues that we're trying to address out of the system, get them treatment, get them help, that makes them better citizens. And, that, and that's what, we, what, what we're working on also. Yeah, Greg is the chair, and I also serve on the Monroe <clears throat> County uh, Opioid Awareness Commission. Uh -huh. And that's sort of what we've been doing is trying to explore not just criminal justice options, but um, treatment and crisis um, options because of the overdoses we were seeing. Yeah. And just how do we prevent death? How do we prevent um, people from getting wrapped up in chaotic drug use? And, and then ultimately, how do we prevent them from getting to the criminal justice system as well? Um, and so, you know, we've been talking with um, Chief Decoff and a lot of different people in the community about the options there. Um, the state, actually, Office of Court Services has mandated that we start uh, in 11 counties pilot pretrial release project. Mm. Um, so pretrial release, so, so that means somebody who's been arrested? Yes. And is awaiting trial? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so uh, the idea behind pretrial release in, in Monroe County is one of the pilot counties uh, is it's, it's a move away from cash bail first. So you're trying to uh, keep it from being uh, unequal in terms of whether you right. can afford to post a cash bail or not. Um, but it's also been shown that people that are incarcerated pretrial, the longer they're incarcerated pretrial, it actually impacts their recidivism rates after they are convicted of the offense. And if they're released earlier, um, they're more likely to have positive outcomes. Even after, after a conviction. Yes, and so um, so we are working on it here locally. Uh, again, Mary Ellen Decoff has been really instrumental in piloting the program. The uh, Monroe County Probation Department has been very active in that. The state has mandated essentially how it works. A risk assessment is performed, and it is an evidence-based risk assessment that's been validated to basically show what is a person's likelihood that they're either going to be rearrested, waiting trial, or they're going to fail to appear and, and participate in their case. And so um, basically you have this risk assessment, people are evaluated and then a recommendation is made and the idea is you release them without any money um, and based on their risk level, uh, you give them conditions that they uh -huh. uh, comply with. And so we're, in the mid we're doing that pilot now. We've been doing that since October of 2016, I huh. believe it's been okay. a while. Um, it's, we're still tinkering. I mean, there are definitely cases where um, we, we only, our only options are release or still rely on this archaic cash bail system. And it's a little hard to bridge that divide when you're dealing with um, violent and sex offenses. But, but we're tinkering with it. We're working on it all the time. Um, but that's, that's a way that we are sort of relieving some of the stress on the jail. Um, which, right. which has stress. I it know. does. It's, it's, it's uh, small yeah. for our community, I think. Yeah. And um, so we are, you know, get, trying to get people out and into services if they need them. Although a lot of times if they are low risk, the only thing, the only condition they have is they receive telephonic notification that they need to show up in court. And there's actually a lot of research that shows that just getting a text message or a phone call a couple days before court increases yes. the likelihood yeah. that they'll show up and answer the charges. So. Sometimes we're not complicated animals. We just do you know, <laughs> something remember. Um, so uh, I, that, the table that you referenced, the work that's going on that many of you are in the middle of, and I've been at that, that is a table with county, city, as you mentioned, a lot of people. One, one description of the problem, and maybe you can help us think about it, was the 2 a.m. problem. I think somebody mentioned that if there's a crisis of, in, a, in a person's life, a substance use, an overdose, or a event where they're intersecting with the system, that crisis period can be a chance to get them into the system. But a 2 a.m. problem, there's not many places to take somebody other than jail or a hospital. Or jail or a hospital, yeah. <coughs> so our community lacks a crisis diversion center, and that is a huge uh, challenge for us. Um, crisis diversion centers are expensive to run. Mm -hmm. um, and to your point, they are that opportunity for someone to begin to think about recovery or engage in some kind of treatment. Um, because if someone has an uh, encounter with the police or the emergency room, 
um, and it's a mental health kind of substance use issue that they're not able to be admitted for to the hospital or detained for by the police, the conversation probably goes something like, you should probably go to Centerstone in the morning. Well, we know that those people don't show up and they will show back up to the hospital or they may have another encounter with the police. And a crisis diversion center is just a safe space for people to go. Um, and there's, there's not any kind of requirement to participate in treatment or do anything. It's just saying, you're having a difficult time right now. This is a space that is calm and quiet. You can go here and stay as long as you need to. And we just earlier this week visited one. Mm -hmm. It was uh, city representatives, county representatives, and center stone in Bull. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like a, I, I thought it seemed like something that would probably work in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to figure out the logistics of that. The money, the money. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. But, but, you know, this is one of those things where, kind of like you referenced, you know, the, the, the um, Crawford Homes, which help chronically homeless get into housing, they saw a great reduction in jail time, hospital time, more employment. It saves money. Sure. It just doesn't always save money for the person paying for it. It's complicated because yes. that, that saving can be different places, but yeah. Yeah, I think that funding just ends up getting moved. <laughs> you know, different people are getting paid to do different things. So it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult to coordinate, but I, uh, I think mm -hmm. overall, uh, a lot of these diversions and treatment courts, things that are based in evidence, end up being cheaper in the long run than housing somebody in a, a place of detention. Okay, I have a, another question. Thank you, Jessica, for sending this in. She says, what about proactive programs that assist high-risk persons before they enter the criminal justice system? Good question. That's, that's some of what uh, the DRO program does. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we we're out there all the time and, and uh, you know, we, we will get periodic calls about, um, you know, people maybe downtown screaming at the top of their lungs and stuff. And, and um, you know, <clears throat> we'll, we'll dispatch the, the DROs and um, again, it's, it's, it's before they get, it's, a, it's, a, it is before, it's they before they get arrested and we're trying to keep them out. And so it is kind of a program that, that uh, if we can get them in, into the right treatment and get them assistance, then we should not encounter them in the future with, with arrest situations. And so, how about you guys? Those, there's things like that. Like, like she's saying, we get there, we're trying to see if we can diffuse the problem before it goes anywhere else. And I think when we show up, a lot of the times we can share and offer these services. Sometimes these individuals know nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And I think when we would show up with like Tammy and stuff like that, sometimes it's individual maybe someone we don't know. And that interaction we have, sometimes we're done having interactions. Mm -hmm. and we start putting them in the services and surround them with care that's taking the problem away for us. Do you, do you, I mean, I, we should mention, of course, there are enormous numbers of social service organizations. We mentioned some, Shalom and, and uh, uh, Wheeler, but places like Middle Way House and, and some of the uh, some of the sobriety homes. There are many people working on these pre pre criminal justice systems. Yes. Do, you, do you have other thoughts about that in your experience, Tammy? How, how do you find when you when you meet people? How do you how, are you kind of just out there looking for folks and Absolutely. interacting with them? Absolutely. I mean, I went in the woods and found campsites. If uh, they've told me so and so is camping, you know, behind this store. I will make You'll sure go. within the next few days that I go check it out, yes. And try to bring them, offer services and that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important for us to be out and building that importance by face, right? So we are going to be out there um, just talking. There don't have, you know, there doesn't have to be a call. Um, we'll right. go out there and just try to build those relationships so then maybe they come before there's even a call, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. It's, it's all about having people out there talking about solutions and how to access resources before there's a problem. Um, and that is the role of, I like to think everyone in the community because we're all aware of resources and how do we be good neighbors to people who are struggling and how do we get them connected to the things that we know are going to make their life better. Um, that happens before a law enforcement encounter. You know, I, 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 um, I'm, I've grown up, I'm old enough to remember that sometimes the criminal justice system was 
was used as a, as a political club to say we need to crack down and, and, and tighten sentences and lengthen sentences and three strikes you're out and there was just this drumbeat of, you know, we have to arrest our way, frankly, and, and incarcerate our way out of social challenges. It is encouraging, I think, that even at the national level and at the state level, we are seeing a different conversation that, that is saying, look, you know, 98% of people come out of jail, as you said, or prison, and we have to we have to think better how we get better results. And it is encouraging, and I'm, one of the things I wanted to get to talk about, which I think we did, is re remembering that Bloomington, Monroe County, this community has been doing this for 20 years, 10 years, 30 years, to try to diminish the need for incarceration and find alternatives. And it, it is encouraging, too, that the conversations now, county, city, partners are, are saying, what's next? For, for improving these outcomes again, so people have better outcomes, and we don't, you, you know, once that in, once incarceration hits, it's a tough thing to get out of. I mean, your your life is different, um, and so that's encouraging. I mean, let me let me um, just again, uh, I'm going to go around and inter uh, remind people who's here, and thank you for being here. If you have final comments you want to make after I do that, we'll we'll uh, we'll welcome that. But we have Dr. Greg May who is Administrative Director uh, at Centerstone of Adult and Family Services, Tammy Giles, also at Centerstone Street Outreach Worker, uh, Mike Peacock, uh, uh, Police Chief of Bloomington Police Department, Erica Oliphant, who is the uh, newly elected recent prosecutor for Monroe County, thank you for being here, Melissa Stone, who is the new social worker with the Bloomington Police Department, and, uh, and also uh, Brett Roram, uh, white shirt, downtown resource <laughs> officer to the Bloomington Police Department. Very important. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would just, I don't know if anybody wants to add final comments. Um, if you do, you are welcome to. If I would just add that I think the partnerships that we have in this city and county is what makes Bloomington a great place. And it allows us to have these resources to offer people. Um, and we're not in a position where our only option is to incarcerate someone. I appreciate that about this county. I have the opportunity to work across the state and a lot of other counties, and we're very fortunate here to have these types of programs. Yeah, and I, I'd just like to add that, that um, for, for our department, the, the resources and partnerships that we have in the community um, are, are just so important because uh, we could do a lot of what we do if we didn't have those, those partnerships. And it, it's, it's a wide uh, ranging group of, of organizations that help us and, and that's very much appreciated and you know one of the things that's traditionally been true for law enforcement and the courts is that we are reactionary we get these problems <coughs> after they've happened so one of the things that's really nice about these the DRO program and, and diversion programs is you're trying to be more proactive and try to try to reach these problems before they become critical well uh, I want to thank you all for being part of this, I want to thank you at this table. It just hit me in the head, too, that I ought to think about, you know, we as a community need to thank our, the people around this table and they, those they represent, the so many people in our community who work so hard every day to try to improve lives for all of us, uh, all of us who are here, and to protect safety and to create those better outcomes by the, by the hard work that you do, and we really appreciate that. And, uh, thank you for being part of this conversation today. Uh, I'm Mayor Hamilton, and, and we'll be signing off. Thank you for participating, and thank you all for sharing the wisdom that you did today and all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.